Thank you all for joining us for the 2024 Winter Webinar Series hosted by the Stockbridge Muncie Community's Historic Preservation Office, located in the homelands in Williamstown, Massachusetts. My name is Sarah Regensberger. I am the Program Coordinator here in the Historic Preservation Office. This call is being recorded and will later be made available as a public recording on the Stockbridge Muncie website. We will end the recording after the presentation ends and before the question and answer portion will begin so that we can provide this recording as an educational tool, as well as prote protect the privacy of those who wish to ask their questions themselves. For those who would like to use this video, rewatch it or share it with friends, a copy will be made available on the landing page currently linked on the Historic Preservation website, as well as on the Stockbridge Muncie Cultural Affairs YouTube channel. I wanna point out a few features of our Zoom call today. For those of you joining us via computer, if you hover your cursor near the bottom of the screen, a toolbar will appear. Click on the Q&A icon to ask questions that arise during the presentation, which we will address afterwards. If you would like to ask your own question, please cl click the raise hand icon after the presentation is finished, and we will get to you after answering all questions in the Q&A box. Everyone was muted upon entering the call and will remain muted until the Q&A portion of the webinar. Today, we are being joined by Anne Morton, owner and principal of Morton Archaeological Research Services. She got her degree from the Univers University of Edinburgh in Edinburgh, Scotland, and has been conducting archaeology for more than 30 years. They conduct archaeology all over New York State and occasionally outside of that, including in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. We are also joined by Hikaru Hayakawa, a senior at Williams College located in Williamstown, Massachusetts, and a central point for both ancestral Mohican life and historic Mohican removal. The Stockbridge Mesa community joined in a partnership with Williams College in October 2020 that provided our historic preservation office with office space and internships funded by the Office of Institutional Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Hikaru was one of the first interns to work with our office through this program. He has helped to lay the groundwork for how our office interacts with the student body and what kinds of projects students work on. He has then worked with our office on subsequent independent studies courses and several presentations about this work. Hikaru will be graduating in May with a degree in history with a concentration in global and environmental studies. We wish him well in all of his future endeavors and thank him for his hard work and dedication. So now, without further ado, Hikaru, take it away. Yeah, um, thank you so much for that very uh, kind introduction and for everything that you're doing and that Topo is doing to make this presentation possible and also for letting Anne and I be a part of your journey. Um, so yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so today, Anne and I will speak uh, specifically about the Tribal Historic Preservation Office's efforts to protect Mohican cultural heritage sites in the Mohican homelands, and to amplify the legacy of Stockbridge Mohican ancestors, specifically in Winnetakook, incorporated as Stockbridge, Massachusetts, by the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the 18th century. And we'll speak more about that momentarily. Um, and for those of you um, who are you know, just joining or not from Stockbridge Muncie community or have not worked with the Tribal Stork Preservation Office before. The Tribal Stork Preservation Office, as you can see on this slide, is located in the Mohican homelands in Williamstown, Massachusetts, and is part of the Stockbridge Muncie Cultural Heritage Department. The department also oversees um, archives at the Arbor E. Miller Memorial Library and Museum and develops language revitalization programs, Mohican and Muncie. The office, um, the Tribal Stork Preservation Office, specifically within the homelands, reviews over 400 projects annually to represent Stockbridge Muncie interests in tribal ancestral territory and to make sure that construction projects are not disturbing sacred burial grounds and other historically significant sites. Another major role of the office is repatriation of ancestors' remains um, and, to, and also repatriation of cultural heritage items. Um, and before we begin, um, I'd like to really emphasize that you know, everything that we're sharing um, tonight or today um, is or comes from multi uh, multi-generational collaborative process. 
um, between Stockbridge Muncie citizens, leaders, and historians uh, who wrote down their memor memories and passed down stories, the Tribal Historic Preservation Office, independent and university affiliated researchers. And I'd also like to specifically mention Rick Wilcox, who I see is joining us today. Uh, Rick Wilcox is a former Stockbridge police chief and local historian who's been committed to restorative research and who collected um, extensive data that made locating many home sites within Winnetakook or Stockbridge possible. And he passed along a lot of this information to Tippo uh, because he, he believed that uh, this was Stockbridge Muncie community story to share. Um, and he's been very pivotal uh, in the story of this. Um, so thank you, uh, Rick. So to begin, um, Stockbridge or Winnetakook is a site of great historic significance. It's been a part of the Mohican homelands, which includes the Berkshires of Massachusetts and the Upper Mahikanatuck or Hudson River Valley of New York since time immemorial. Uh, and it's also been known, um, as I mentioned, as Winnetakook or the Great Meadow uh, in Mohican, um, as well as Indian Town uh, during the 18th century. And Stockbridge was the site of an experiment of dual governance in the 18th century, in which Mohican sachems, Konkapot, and Mpachini made the decision in consultation with 100 Stockbridge Mohican ancestors to recenter the Mohican nation within Stockbridge under pressure of dispossession, and for the Stockbridge uh, Mohican nation to co govern a town at this site with a small group of English settlers and a missionary. Um, and however, by the end of the century, the settlers had dispossessed the lands of the Mohicans in Stockbridge through dubious practices, forcing them to leave a town specifically constructed for them and to accept an invitation from the Oneida Nation to relocate to New York. Through later dispossession, uh, Mohe Stockbridge Muncie ancestors eventually relocated to Wisconsin. And this quote is an example of um, the history and the historical research and efforts um, of past Mohican la uh, leaders and summarizes some of the, the histories uh, and themes that I just mentioned. Um, and so I'll give you a minute to, to take a look at it, but I did summarize uh, most of it. Okay, so moving on, something that uh, we really want to emphasize is how Stockbridge Muncie ancestors um, have really made an effort to re remain connected to their homelands um, and to be very aware of these histories and to continue to pass them on. And this is another quote from Mohican diplomat John Quinney, um, which demonstrates, um, like as we've said, that Stockbridge Muncie community ancestors have always maintained relations with their homelands and have continued to come back to ensure protection of Stockbridge Muncie histories uh, and ancestors. Um, and this uh, speech is from the uh, mid 19th century. And in that tradition, um, there have been a lot more recent efforts, especially by the Tribal Historic Preservation Office uh, in order to um, amplify the histories of Stockbridge Muncie community, as well as to provide a space for young Stockbridge Muncie citizens and, and other Stockbridge Muncie people, as well as people um, who reside in these towns um, who are descendants of settlers to really learn more about these histories um, and to see like how uh, they continue on and they continue to shape um, today. And this is another example of that work. So despite all of this history and despite all of these long-term connections, um, until recently, none of this information was listed on the National Park Service's National Register of Historic Places. And until recently, there was no visible recognition of Stockbridge Muncie histories uh, in this area, despite its significance to the town's history, uh, Stockbridge Muncie history, U.S. history, and the history of Indigenous North America. As you can see on the form, Stockbridge uh, was listed as a historic site, um, but it was only listed on as a historic site by the National Register of Historic Places um, uh, at, due to its architecture and unique community planning and development and not its relation to Mohican histories, even though these Mohican histories are the vast majority of you know, the, the histories are, or they're so much longer than these other histories. And accordingly, with the support of the town of Stockbridge, the Tribal Historic Preservation Office applied for the Underrepresented Communities Grant for the National Park Services to amend uh, the listing on the National Register of Historic Places to better reflect Mohican history in the district. 
and TIPO, or the Travel Story Preservation Office, received it in 2021. And this is where my journey with TIPO came in. Um, I was very lucky to um, be able to come on to the office the summer of my first year at Williams College and to receive mentorship from Bonnie Hartley, um, as well as Nathan Allison, who was also working there at the time. And as part of my internship, I focused on six updates out of a total of 11 um, in terms of home sites uh, within this area. Um, and I also worked on recruiting volunteers for the archeological excavation in order to really bring together um, a community of people who could better understand Mohican histories and who were dedicated uh, to further restorative work. And so in terms of really uh, centering Mohican histories, um, so as I mentioned, so I'll just go back quickly, as you can see on this form, um, it, it says areas of significance. Um, and yeah, those areas of significance are just architecture and community planning. And what um, TIPO was able to do was to expand the criteria to ensure that Stockbridge Muncie histories were also included, including adding a section in terms of uh, relationships to indigenous history. So specifically these sites, um, you know, the first uh, Indian school um, in Thomas Sharon and Yonaka's home site, um, the Aaron uh, Sasakak plowing lands um, and so on. Um, and then also, uh, Tippo added another section related to persons significant to the past of Stockbridge Muncie community. Um, and I'll just briefly share the stories of some of these people, um, as I as some of them I know are direct ancestors of people on this call. For example, Nananikana, um, who played a key role in helping to protect the Stockbridge Muncie uh, Mohicans by serving on committees uh, during this period of collaborative governance, collaborating with community leaders and petitions, and surveying the town. Um, and he was also known for um, sweeping the, the meeting house, the central meeting house that was the center of the town and blowing the conch shell to bring together people for worship. And not only did he dedicately serve the Stockbridge Mohican community, but he also fought in the Revolutionary War. Um, and he was also, he was one of at least 60 Stockbridge Mohicans who served in the war. Another um, home site belongs to John Konkapat, a prominent leader and diplomat in the Mohican community. He's thought to have grown up in the, along the Hudson River after being born in 1690. And throughout his lifetime, he helped protect Stockbridge Mons, the Stockbridge Mohican community through important decisions, petitions, and land negotiations. In fact, he signed the first earliest known land deed in the Berkshires in the 18th century. Um, and together with Mpachini, uh, Konkupat uh, was instrumental in the decision to establish this experiment in co-governance at Stockbridge. And all of these initiatives in order to um, address this erasure of Mohican histories um, was also um, like accompanied by other initiatives, including the Mohican walking tour of Stockbridge, um, which started with you know, Body and Rick and other people sitting together and drawing Mohican hope sites onto a map. And while no information was listed before, uh, now through these efforts and now through this tour that you can see, um, Stockbridge Muncie citizens can return to Stockbridge and see where their direct ancestors lived and other people can engage with the histories. Um, and another related initiative um, has been the Tribal Stork Preservation Office's collaboration with the trustees of the reservation to open exhibits at the Mission House Museum, start a medical plant garden, and repatriate all of the Mohican items in the Mission House collection. Um, so in terms of how the archeological excavations fit in, um, well, they can be understood as augmenting all of these efforts, including educating the community, but also, most importantly, providing additional information to support the completion of the National Register of Historic Place nominations, including um, specific information about sites, as well as location of various buildings. And with the support of the Underrepresented Communities Grant, the Town of Stockbridge, and the Massachusetts Historical Commission, uh, Stockbridge Muncie undertook uh, archaeological excavations at the 1739 Meeting House site, in front of the first congregational church in Stockbridge and the site of King Solomon's home in the 1783 George Washington Oxroast. Um, and this was my uh, second month of the internship. So uh, this was really a personally extraordinary opportunity uh, to be a part of um, and to really learn and be a part of, I think one of the most meaningful projects uh, that I've been a part of um, so far. Um, and so in terms of the meeting house, the meeting house is where religious and political meetings were held in Stockbridge during this period of co-governance, and it's where Stockbridge Muncie ancestors advocated for the community, signed petitions, made agreements, and prayed and worshipped. The 1783 George Washington Mohican Ox Roast um, was a feast um, that was located um, um, close to Laurel or on Laurel Hill. 
uh, in which George Washington honored the Stockbridge Mohicans and their alliance with the U.S. in the American Revolutionary War with a feast in a thousand a hundred pound ox. And as mentioned, at least 59 Stockbridge Mohicans volunteered to fight for their U.S. allies during the American Revolutionary War. And the first Native American, the first two Native American casualties in the war were Stockbridge Mohicans. And according to historical documentation, um, the ox roast took place near the home site of King Solomon, a prominent Mohican sachem who represented the Mohicans in diplomatic negotiations with King George III to prevent further encroachments on the Mohican homelands. And these two sites bookmark a 50 year uh, unique period of dual governance in Stockbridge. Um, thank you, and um, I'll pass it along to Anne to talk more about the excavation um, and the histories. So, first, can everybody hear me okay? Everybody here? Good. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures from the excavations that we did. Uh, we had wonderful volunteers from the community, from uh, Williams College, uh, and from uh, all over but this picture in the upper left-hand corner, it may look like we're sheltering from the rain, but in fact, it is blowing a gale. And we are desperately hanging on to this tent to keep it from flying into the road and taking out a truck. And we are we are soaking wet. You can advance it one, Hakaru. Huh, I wanna thank the Stockbridge Muncie community uh, for allowing us to be part of this project. It was a great honor for us to be able to participate. In the summer of 2021, our team came to Stockbridge, Massachusetts to do two projects. This included Dr. Jared Burks from Ohio Valley Archeology, span who did the uh, non-invasive surveys, uh, Dr. Marie Loren Pipes, who handled the cultural objects, and my team from Morton Archaeological, who handled the archaeological field work. The two projects were the Stockbridge 1739 Meeting House and National Register Update, and the Mohican Ox Roast King Solomon Community Archaeology Project. Next slide, please. As Hakairo has already mentioned, these two projects really bookmark the experience of the Mohicans with Indian Town from about 1736 to about 1783. Stockbridge, of course, had been part of the Mohican homelands from time immemorial. Um, but Indian Town was something different. In addition to Christianization of the Mohican ancestors, being baptized, given Christian names, uh, attending church, learning English, the Mohican ancestors shared the governance of the town with the selected English settlers. The Stockbridge Muncie community takes the name Stockbridge from their time at Indian Town. We hope to be able to locate these two important sites, the Meeting House, and the ox roast. Next slide, please. The meeting house was a center for community life. It was a church, but it was also a secular structure where the functions of town government were carried out. We didn't know what it looked like, but here are two possible examples for what uh, the meeting house might have looked like. Uh, on the survey from 1750, you can see the meeting house at the very west end of Plain Street, what's now Main Street in Stockbridge. And we have a survey showing it in relation to the burial ground. Next slide. However, uh, even with the survey map, we couldn't be exactly sure where the meeting house sat, in part because we're not sure what the boundaries on the 1750 map were. Were they the parcel boundaries? Were they the fence line? Were they where the roads were? Uh, so we thought the best way to start was to be doing some non-invasive survey. And uh, Jared and his team came out and did some geophysical survey using uh, magnetic gradiometry and ground penetrating radar. 
uh, to help us make a picture of what we could see under the ground. And you can see Jared right here uh, with the uh, ground penetrating radar machine, looks like a gigantic lawnmower, but without any blades. Uh, we identified 29 anomalies in the town park. Um, and from those we selected uh, five that we thought had a reasonably good chance of being what we were looking for. Um, and if you're looking at that map right now, we selected numbers one, seven, 10, 13, and 14. Seven turned out to be the stone and concrete base for a signpost. 10 was a tree hole. You, you have to ground truth these things. You have to actually dig to see what the picture actually is when you, you open the ground up. Next slide. Is it advanced? Oh, there we go. Anomaly one, though, was a little more interesting. At first, as you can see on the far left, we found a tree. Um, and you can see that from the big root. It's directly in front of my feet. Um, and yes, my feet are in almost every picture I take. When we remove that, in the middle slide, you can see we found a square black splodge. And when we started to remove that, we found a square corner. And I can remember looking at that and saying to myself, well, that's not supposed to be there. Next slide, please. In fact, what we had found was a builder's trench. And a builder's trench is the hole that you dig to lay the foundation for a building in. Uh, this one would have been laid at the time when the, uh, the meeting house was initially constructed. And at the time when the meeting house was disassembled and the parts were removed, uh, they would have taken the stone foundation out and refilled it with dirt. And that's why the dirt that you can see where it says builder's trench looks all funny colored and jumbled from when the hole was refilled. Because of the work that Rick Wilcox has done, we know that there really was only one English style building in the town park until the chime tower was built. And that building was the meeting house. There were a couple of other pieces of information that helped us to see that this is very, very likely to be the meeting house. One of them is that picture in the center, which is a piece of lead flashing or lead came, and it's the uh, lead edging that holds uh, glass windows into their window frames. The other is an 18th century nail, blacksmith made, and it has a very classic, what's called a rose head on it. Um, and this is an absolutely classic uh, item that you'd have found in the late 1700s. The foundation for this meeting house is actually still there. It was used in the second meeting house, which is up, up the road, I believe near the Arboretum. Rick can correct me if I got that wrong. Um, and that was actually identified um, in 2010, also using ground penetrating radar. Um, and I should have mentioned but when I was initially putting this together, but we think there's a reasonable chance that other pieces of the meeting house may still uh, be around. Good, thank you, next one. Anomalies 13 and 14 were more surprises. Below the fill for the war memorial was a Mohican home site. In fact, two Mohican home sites, one on top of the other. The upper floor was associated with a layer of ash and charcoal. And if you look at the picture on your right hand side, you can see burning from the hearth and fire, that black layer there, um, that's from the fire. Um, and we also had firecrack rock, the picture on your left hand side. And those are rocks that are heated in a fireplace um, until they break apart. Next slide. And here now you're looking at 
that upper living floor, that upper dirt floor, um, it gets to be a kind of funny gray color because people are burning uh, charcoal, they're cooking, they're walking on it. Uh, we also found a, po a post hole or a possible post hole, which would have held a post probably for the roof. We're not really sure if it actually was circular or if that's just because of the way we dug the site. Um, and way off to the left corner of that picture, you can just barely see where the lower living floor is. They're separated by a layer of subsoil. We also found uh, quartz chipping debris. Um, that's what's left over from making a tool, um, probably a lot like this quartz point that I found on eBay. Um, it could be very old. Um, we know that Mohegan ancestors were certainly in the area 3,500 years ago, um, but quartz tools like this were made and used right up to contact with the Europeans. Based on what we were able to find from the geophysical survey and from the archeology, span we now know where the meeting house is located. And if you look at that dotted rectangle, that's where the meeting house sat in the town park. We also identified two Mohican home sites, Nadakana one, and my apologize, apologies if I mangled that, that Mohican, and Nadakana three. Nadakana three did not have any living floors, but it did have burning and a post mold. And uh, we think that it's likely, but not certain that there was a second Mohican house located to the, the west of the Chime, Chime Tower. These are the first archeologically recorded clear Mohican houses in the Berkshires. Next slide. So as Picaro had said, uh, in 1783, uh, four warriors went to meet with George Washington at his headquarters in Newburgh uh, for what was to be one last conference. They were looking for a testament of their loyalty uh, to serve them as protection as they traveled from Stockbridge, Massachusetts to New Stockbridge in the United Territory. Washington, well aware and wishing to honor them for their service and their bravery uh, during the war uh, gave them the promised uh, gave the promised testimony and he also ordered that an ox roast feast be prepared and an ox roast feast was a traditional way to honor your allies for their service an ox roast feast was a big deal uh, you can see in the lower left hand corner there's a picture uh, from the 1700s you would have built a big enclosure. The ox would have roasted for several days. Um, there would have been extensive fire and burning, and then everyone would have come to feast. And it says, the feast was kept near this residence of King Solomon, and after it was over, the Indians buried the hatchet in token of that war that was passed and performed other ceremonies for the gratification of the company. Um, and interestingly, the mission house has it in its collection a hatchet, although we're not saying that that's the hatchet that was buried. Next slide. We knew from the work that Rick had done and also from the 1855 map that you saw on the previous slide that King Solomon's house was near the Mary V. Flynn Trail uh, in the town park, but we didn't know where. And so again, Jared and his team came out and did two kinds of non-invasive survey. They used magnetic susceptibility and magnetometer to see what we could see in making a picture of what was under the ground. And here in the upper left, you can see Jared and Alex. Alex is just about to walk straight through a patch of ticks and come out covered in ticks. We saw a lot of different things uh, when we when they analyzed the survey, many of the things were iron objects. 
Uh, there was a really good candidate uh, sort of in the center of the picture that we thought might be the ox roast, had really, really good images. And then we had this kind of odd line of pits or burned features. At first we thought it might be some sort of a water pipe with iron bands. But having analyzed that, we picked out a number of different locations for us to test archeologically. Next slide. The one that we were really hoping was the ox roast, turned out to be a bridge cable. Uh, a lot like the one that you can see on the bridge that's the pedestrian bridge that's currently over to uh, the Mary of Eastland Trail. Um, Rick tells me that it was common for property owners to build bridges in the 18 and 1900s across to uh, the property, uh, but not an ox roast. A number of the others turned out to be random pieces of metal. However, two of the anomalies turned out to be something else. More Mohican homes. Anomaly five, which you can see in the lower end of that line of circles, also had two living floors, an upper floor and a lower floor, each associated with extensive burning. And in the case of the lower floor, with a definite clear hearth feature. And if you're looking at that drawing in the center, that brown blot that looks kind of like flat pudding, that's the, the hearth feature. And that hearth feature was associated with uh, chipping debris. We were able to get enough uh, carbon from the excavations that we were able to radiocarbon date the upper hearth, and that produced a radiocarbon date of about 1400 AD, um, what we as archaeologists call the late woodland period. Absolutely classic for uh, Mohicans being uh, it's settled in the area. Uh, Anomaly 9, sort of at the end of that, that line, uh, didn't produce a floor, but it did produce charcoal and ash, uh, more chipping debris, and more fire cracked rock. Now, these features were deep. We were down over three feet um, to find them. And we got charcoal from Anomaly 9 as well, and it produced a date in the middle 1700s. Next slide. We identified these two living sites, these two home sites, as Nadakana 2 and Nadakana 4. Nadakana 2 is the one with the two living floors dating to about 13 to 1400 AD. Um, in addition to chipping debris, we also recovered a fish scale and some pin cherry pits, uh, which suggest uh, that this site was probably uh, being occupied in the fall or the early winter. Nadakana 4, radiocarbon dated to the middle 1700s. It's a much less good date just because the closer you come to present, the more iffy radiocarbon dates get. But it's possible that this is contemporary with uh, the Mohican ox roast and when, when King Solomon and his family were living on this site. And my second favorite picture, there's Bonnie Hartley standing on the lower living floor in Nadakana 2, standing on the floor of her ancestors. Uh, just one more. I took this picture on the left-hand side in December of 2021. I'm standing on the Dakana 2, looking towards the Hustonic River. The park has changed very little since uh, King Solomon and his family were living there. And I think it's likely that if the ancestors were to return, they would still recognize the place. Thank you. Back to you, Karu. Yes, um, thank you for that, Anne. Um, yeah, so these several home sites and meeting uh, and the meeting house um, all like constitute irrefutable evidence of what many of you and many Stockbridge Muncie ancestors had already been telling everyone 
and what we know um, through their writings that these are the Mohican homelands. Um, for a long time, local historians had written off or written out Mohican people out of the histories of this region. Um, but um, the evidence here of several pre-contact uh, living sites um, like provide irrefutable evidence to those um, settlers um, who would question that history. Um, and with knowledge of these sites, most importantly, citizens can come back and stand directly in the homes of their ancestors. Um, and, and also identifying the site of this meeting house, um, which isn't a Mohican home site, was greatly meaningful due to the histories there that so many sachems um, and leaders and, um, and Mohican ancestors wrote petitions and letters there. Um, and I think, you know, for me, uh, it was very personally meaningful to be a part of this process and to, you know, be able to, to be there with Donnie Ann and with so many of the other people who are on the call today. Um, I became very aware that these histories are all around us. Some of it is very visible in the landscape. Some of it is visible in the state of our ecosystems. And it's also underneath us, too. Um, and significantly, many others were also interested in these efforts and these lessons, too. As you can see, the National Park Services, the Smithsonian, New England Public Media, and Berkshire Eagle and other publications also picked up um, on this story, recognizing how important it is. And importantly, many people also learned um, about Stockbridge Mentally history through the process of volunteering. This was a community effort. Altogether, the Travel Stork Preservation Office recruited around 51 volunteers and over 80 people expressed interest. And we also received support from a lot of other organizations, uh, including shovels, gloves, vans, and even sandwiches. Um, unfortunately, at the time, uh, there was a travel ban for Stockbridge Muncie community. And for the large part, uh, most volunteers were Williams College students, faculty, and staff, um, as well as local residents. Um, in the future, however, the Tribal Stork Preservation Office has mentioned that they're interested in starting field schools and engaging Stockbridge men's youth in historical research, um, for which um, uh, current employees of the Stockbridge men's Tribal Stork Preservation Office can talk about later or mention later in the Q&A. Um, and even though we wish that we could have engaged more Stockbridge Muncie citizens, we were able to form a lot of very meaningful relationships and the basis for future community partnerships. Um, and you know, beyond uh, there, beyond the archaeological excavation, there are so many projects that happened. Um, whether it's you know some of the the people on this call, like Dave Dewey volunteering. Um, whether it's class projects or even the independent study that Sarah mentioned in the beginning with a few other Williams students that really came out of the relationships developed during this archaeological excavation. Um, and, and I think like I was telling Anne the other day, um, when we were going through through the slides, I think there's no other, there's nothing that bonds you as much as standing out together in the rain, uh, covered in mud. Uh, I think there there were several days where um you know, a volunteer would drop me off um, in front of the Travel Stork Preservation Office and my hair would be covered in mud. And I just knew that, um, you know, I, I must have looked so strange to people, but that was a common experience and um, with, with the other people who are also at the excavation. Um, but beyond those people who directly committed to future projects, um, we also had so many meaningful conversations and ideas for future work. And people who are not even involved or volunteering would come and stop by and ask, like Anne and Bonnie and Nathan Allison, what we were doing. Um, and some of them would even do their own online research and come back with more questions. Um, and personally, um, as I mentioned, this was a very meaningful experience, but especially because I was a first year and I'd been going through COVID at the time, um, I was really able through this process um, to meet so many incredible people and really create a community um, for myself at, at Williams and to really meet people who are committed to uh, making a difference um, and so, as I mentioned, this is one of the most important projects I've ever been a part of my life. And thank you to Bonnie and the Travel Historic Preservation Office and Stockbridge Muncie community for letting us be a part of your journey. I know I'm not the only one who feels this way. Um, but most importantly, beyond um, all of this, uh, the Travel Stork Preservation Office uh, and Borden um, and her company were able to compile the information together, um, and the Travel Stork Preservation Office successfully updated uh, the National Register of Historic Places. Um, and in November last year, this was finally recognized, and now Mohican histories are no longer erased, and they're central to the listing of Stockbridge. Um, on the National Register of Historic Places. And by doing this, um, 
Like this has been sort of an ongoing effort to really challenge the erasure of Stockbridge Muncie histories and amplify the legacy of Stockbridge Muncie ancestors in Stockbridge, a town that would have never had existed were it not for Mohican presence in the homeland since time immemorial and the fateful decision of the Sachems, Kongapat and Umpanchini uh, with, your an with the Stockbridge Muncie ancestors in the 1730s. So thank you for staying with us. Um, I know it's been, um, I think over 40 minutes um, and I would also like to give a brief shout out um, to the town of Stockbridge, uh, the National Park Services, who supported with funding in terms of the underrepresented communities grant, as well as the Stockbridge Historical Commission um, and others for really being a part of this process um, and really making this happen and be such a community driven process. Uh, you can learn more about all of this work um, by following Cultural Affairs Department's works and events on Facebook, um, like looking at some of the news articles that have been published online um, and visiting the Stockbridge Mohican walking tour um, online. Um, and so uh, with that, I'd just like to conclude um, and to open up for questions.